On the 17th of August 1941, a convoy of Royal Navy ships on a very special mission left Scarpa Flow in Scotland. Their passengers included 2,700 Royal Air Force servicemen of the newly formed 151 wing, consisting of pilots, ground crews and mechanics, as well as a member of parliament, a Polish expressionist painter, an American newspaper reporter and, perhaps strangest of all, a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, the London-born feminist Charlotte Haldane. This strange collection of individuals were bound for the Soviet Union, Britain's newest and unlikeliest ally in the war against Germany. The voyage was part of what the Air Force called Operation Benedict and had a specific goal, to bring a wing of British Hurricane fighters and their pilots to Russia, where they would fly combat operations around Murmansk while training Soviet crews and pilots how to fly the new machines that have been desperately requested by Stalin's government to replace the staggering losses the Soviet Air Force have taken since the beginning of Operation Barbarossa in June. This new cooperation was naturally highly publicised by both nations, but it got off to a rather inauspicious start when, upon arrival, one of the crew took a rifle bullet in the arm from Red Army troops on shore who mistook the British uniforms for German ones. The surprises continued when everyone, presumably with the exception of Mrs Haldane, was astonished to discover that virtually all the Soviet dock workers were female, and were agog once again to discover that there was no existing road to Murmansk from the port. A few days later, 24 Hurricanes and their pilots aboard the aircraft carrier HMS Argus got ready to take off and fly to Wenger Airfield to join the rest of the expedition. The pilots expressed a bit of concern at the short length of the deck, but with the instruction of the Navy pilots, all of them got safely airborne. Because they were so close to the North Pole, their magnetic compasses were unreliable, and so to help them navigate, one of the escorting destroyers turned away to point in the direction of their destination so the Hurricanes could follow it and fly off in that direction until they reached land. This they did, and after 20 minutes, to their relief, the coast hove into view below them, and the airfield proved mercifully easy to spot. Over the course of the next two months, 151 Wing commenced operations against the Luftwaffe, whose complacent pilots were shocked to discover RAF fighters operating in the darkest depths of Russia. On the first day of operations, three BF-109 fighters were confirmed shot down, along with one Henschel reconnaissance aircraft. The British lost only one pilot during the entire operation, Sergeant Nudger Smith, who was buried with full military honours in a village overlooking the Kola Inlet. Over the course of this period, Soviet ground crews and air crews were progressively familiarised with the British aircraft, undergoing conversion training from their existing I-16 fighters until eventually they were confident enough to start flying combat sorties of their own. Oddly enough, this familiarisation ended up going both ways as one Corporal Flockhart was discovered to have snuck away to fly as an aerial gunner on one of the Soviet bombers. His commanding officer gave him a dressing down for this, saying, I admire your spirit. Personally, I think it's a bloody good show. But all the same, if you'd got shot down, you'd have put me in the soup. In total, the British pilots shot down 16 enemy aircraft, and not a single Soviet bomber was lost on their watch. Their only casualty was Sergeant Smith, and four pilots were awarded the Order of Lenin by the Soviet government. They left aboard the cruiser HMS Kenya, leaving their hurricanes behind, but taking with them a pet reindeer, the wing mascot donated to them by Soviet Major General Kuznetsov. On the 7th of December, they arrived back in Scotland, where they learned the momentous news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and with this bombshell, Operation Benedict was finally concluded. Dear Jack, I hope this letter finds you well, if indeed it finds you at all. I'm not entirely sure how prompt the post is going to be, nor how much of this ends up crossed out by the censors, so suffice to say, the current date as of writing is the 3rd of October. Things have gotten a bit chaotic lately. Apparently it's been all over the newsreels, so I suppose I shan't get in much trouble for telling you that I'm in Russia. I am among the band of lucky fools that have been given the opportunity to avail ourselves of the company of our new Eastern comrades. No doubt you shall find it quite funny that my passing familiarity with the language from our university days has indeed proven useful. 
So useful, in fact, a typing center on a little mission of my own. The weather up north where we've been flying has gotten so dark and cold now that we're not doing much flying at all. So some of our Soviet comrades, I, I would say Russian, but as it turns out, there's people from all sorts of places here, have been sent south with their new hurricanes to the Moscow front. Unfortunately, on account of my talents as an amateur interpreter, I've been sent with them. Someone important wants me to take charge and continue instructing the crews on getting the best out of their aircraft until we all get shipped back home. I suppose that sounds a bit vague, and although I'd like to go into more details, I'm quite sure the sensors would ink it all out, so it would achieve nothing. Suffice to say, I am now writing to you from a dugout in a field somewhere called Zinino, and shall remain here for the foreseeable, apparently. Frankly, the whole damn country is a complete state. I don't think anyone here even entertains the notion of fighting a war on their own soil, now the Jerrys have gotten within spitting distance of Moscow itself, so... Seems obvious that things are a bit desperate. Desperate enough, in fact, that they've started sending women to fly the bloody plates. We've got one in our squadron right now, and despairingly, she has the second most flight hours of everyone here. Not including myself, of course. Actually, I should like to make a small correction. It's not a squadron anymore. This is officially the 157th Fighter Air Regiment. At least I think that's the correct translation. I have to admit, I do like the sound of it. Something very dignified about the title of Air Regiment, even if it counts for very bloody little when you're ankle deep in Russian mud. Regardless, though, I worry about the state of the squadron, whatever we're calling it. A lot of them don't have a lot of experience, and half of them are astonished to see an aircraft with a radio, which uh, certainly doesn't bode well. I took them out for their first patrol a couple of days ago, and one of them, a chap called Philip, managed to prang it on landing. Luckily, he managed to get away with a few cuts and bruises, but I doubt he'll be quite so lucky next time. Anyway, I should wrap this up before I either run out of ink or it starts to freeze, which is apparently something that does happen here when it gets cold enough. I dearly hope I shall be back home by then. I don't think I'm quite cut out for a Russian winter. The Germans are welcome to it. Give my best to Florence and the children, although the way things are going, there's probably a good chance I might arrive back in Blighty before this letter does. Yours faithfully, your old chum, Jimmy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Sorcerer Dave, and welcome to Isle 2 Stermovic Great Battles. We're doing another campaign on the channel. And uh, we're once again using Pat Wilson's campaign generator, as you can see, instead of the native uh, career mode, just because I prefer it a bit. Good old PWCG is still going strong, and I'm going to keep on using it, I think. Um, so, welcome to our new campaign. Welcome to our new squadron. Uh, our character this time around is Major James Wallace. Opera uh, well, he's 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 got the, the honorary <laughs> Soviet rank of Major. Uh his actual rank is probably, I don't know, squadron leader or something. Because he's an RAF pilot that's in charge of a Soviet squadron on the Moscow front. Uh, he's been posted south from the um, from Murmansk, where the rest of the Operation Benedict guys are. And he's in charge of uh, shaping up this squadron of Soviet Hurricane pilots as best as he possibly can, before presumably buggering off back home to Blighty as soon as possible. It is the current state of the squadron. As you can see, we are the 157th Fighter Air Regiment stationed at Zanino. Uh, we're not very far from Moscow. The battle is not going very well. It's 1941. It's 3rd of October 1941, as a matter of fact, and the Germans are getting awfully close to Moscow. Things are not looking good, but the winter is closing in. Perhaps that will make all the difference. Spoilers, it did. <laughs> uh, but we find ourselves on the Eastern Front at a time which was not a healthy time to be a Soviet fighter pilot, let's be honest. If we go to top aces, the top aces in the sky, as you can see, are pretty much all German. Yes, they're all German. Heinrich Bach, Gunther Rahl, Dieter, and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, many of these, by the way, are actually going to be in squadrons that we're facing off in this camp again, facing off against in this campaign. If I go to the intelligence map, uh, you will see. If we scroll over this way, that's where we're based at Zanino. But if we look at some of these, JG one JG fifty one, uh, 
status elite. JG52 status elite. Um, these guys are, 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 are basically all the German squadrons are elite, and all of the Soviet squadrons are novices. And that means that the German AI is going to be better in game than the Soviet AI. And lots of us are going to die. Oh dear, it's not going to be fun. Um, we're in the Hurricane as well, and they're in 109Fs. And, uh, well, you know, the Hurricane's not really... Well, oh dear. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. Yeah, we're a bit, a bit outperformed, suffice to say. But that's the fun, right? I like flying as the underdogs in flight sims like this. I find it to be much, much more fun and much more engaging and much more um, challenging. That's, that's certainly the case here anyway. Um, as you can see, I've already flown one mission. It was going to be the original episode one of the series, but then the recording screwed up because, you know, that's just the way it always seems to go when I start a new series. Something goes horribly wrong within the first episode, and then on this occasion, the first episode was actually missing a whole chunk of recording right in the middle, so um, we're going to just write that one off. Uh, nothing particularly interesting happened anyway. We just sort of took off, flew around. I shot at a couple of Ju-87 Stukas and damaged them, and uh, Vasily Zubkov got the squadron's first air-to-air -air kill, actually. He managed to shoot one of them down. Um, I, I did not have any success myself, and you'll you'll see why when we get into it. This is the squadron, though, as it stands. We've got our character, James Wallace, here, as you can see. He's got a Soviet logbook, because apparently his RAF one's all full up. No awards and citations yet. We'll be getting Soviet ones, obviously, because it's a Soviet campaign, this. Um, our second in command is Captain Gleb Zolotnik. Uh... The pronunciations are going to be hard work in this series. I'm going to get them all sorts of wrong. Uh, Philip Teplov here is currently injured. This uh, little cheeky fella here, he's injured because he crashed his plane on landing in the last mission. Um, well done, Philip. Try better next time, mate. Um, it's worth noting, actually, that um, we have a female squadron member, Luidza here. Louis uh, let's, uh, let's take a bash at this pronunciation. Luidza Miatlev, I think? Uh, at this period of the war, the Soviets uh, were running a little low on manpower, and so therefore they decided to uh, include woman power <laughs> into the equation, and uh, they started recruiting a lot of uh, female pilots, some of whom went on to become actually relatively famous fighter races in their own right. Don't know how long Luis is going to last here. She's actually, out of the entire squadron, she's got the second most missions under her belt, interestingly enough. Um, there's us which has well, we have one mission logged in the minute but obviously Mr Wallace here has, has got plenty of previous experience presumably flying in the Battle of Britain and such and so forth prior to this um, but Zolotnik has got 44 missions uh, and she's got 28 which makes her the second highest you know number of flight hours in the squadron and that is relevant because the way the uh, the game that well well the way Pat Wilson's campaign generator calculates how clever the AI for a, for a given pilot is is essentially an algorithm based on number of missions completed and number of air-to-air -air kills. So the more missions under your belt, the smarter the AI for that pilot is. So Zlotnik is probably going to be our smartest pilot and stands the best chance of surviving the longest, and she's probably got the second best chance of surviving the longest. But that doesn't really mean an awful lot, generally speaking, because all it takes is one 109 to just bounce out of the sky and wreck you with his cannon and then that's it it doesn't matter how good your ai is or if you're the player <laughs> that's just you dead um we're gonna have to worry about that a lot i'm afraid anyway um I, yeah there's a little tour of the pat wilson's campaign generator in interface we're gonna go ahead and generate a new mission nice thing about being the squadron leader and we are the squadron leader this time um is that we can generate a mission with roll. We can select specifically what we actually want to do, and I'd like to do a fighter mission today. Uh, we'll be doing plenty of ground attack and raiding missions um, because we are flying the Hawker Hurricane, and that is primarily what the Soviets actually used it for, ground attack. And at the, actually, at this point in the war, the Allies, in general, were pretty much using the Hawker Hurricane as a ground attacker by this point. It was a little bit too slow to really function as a frontline fighter, um, but nevertheless, you know, times are desperate here on the Eastern Front, so we'll be flying plenty of fighter missions anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and generate. I'll show you the whole mission generation process here. In future episodes, I will skim past an awful lot of this uh, and jump straight to the uh, 
to the flying, I think, just for brevity's sake. Um, but since this is the very first episode of the series, I thought I'd take you through the process. Um, so it looks like we're going to be doing a frontline patrol as the Germans advance down here to the south of us. Uh, out of reference, Moscow is just up here. So we really are practically a stone's throw away. Uh, and the Germans are continuing their advance here towards Miatlebo, I believe. So our job for today is going to be to take off, fly down here south and patrol around and look for some Germans to shoot at, essentially. Uh, there'll be two other friendly Soviet squadrons in the sky today, the 495th Fighter Air Regiment and the 126th, who it looks like um, are going to be in the same area of operations for, as us, so we should look out for those guys. Looks like it's going to be a squadron of uh, I-16s. The guys in the little Ishex, uh, and a squadron of Lendley's P-40s as well. We're going to be doing some ground attack in the area. That's interesting to know. All right. All right, next waypoints. Uh, our altitude today is going to be about just over, well, just shy of 6,000 feet. It looks like quite high up then. Um, if you want to... We're going to have a whole uh, Imperial versus metric problem in this campaign because we are flying a British-made aircraft with uh, Imperial instruments in a country which uses metric measurements for everything. So, um, general rule of thumb, I think, if you want meters into feet, you multiply it by three and then take a little bit off the top. So, I... That'd be six, twelve, about... 18,000, call it 17, 16,000 feet, I think probably is where we're going to be flying on this one. Uh, although I am, of course, in charge, and so, you know, I have my prerogative. I can decide if we're actually, we want to go a bit lower, a little bit higher than that. We can absolutely do that. It's the nice thing about being in charge, you know, it's good to be the king, etc. Uh, looks like it's going to be four o'clock in the afternoon, this one. Uh, we'll take 100% fuel. I see no reason why not to. Um pilots okay we've got four of us assigned to this one I'm, I'm happy with that um i have i am tempted to take out the entire squadron virtually in one go i have done that in the past it's sort of um it's an interesting one because uh, in the hawker hurricane we're at a serious disadvantage versus enemy fighters so in theory you really want to outnumber them when when you can um i do find though sometimes that the friendly ai is so poor that really all you achieve is providing the enemy with a target-rich environment. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the, the AI for some of our newest pilots is so is so poor that they're pretty much just going to fly in circles and not really achieve much other than getting shot to pieces by the Germans. So um, there is a certain balance between the number of people you want to take and the number you shouldn't take with you in this, and I've yet to find really the ideal solution. But anyway, um, payload for this mission. Now, as you can see, the Hawker Hurricane Mark II has a plethora of different options available for loadout. Uh, now, many of these were not historically available to us at this stage of the war. We will, if we survive long enough, because this is an Iron Man, Iron Man campaign, so if we die, that's the end of the campaign. Um, if we survive long enough, we'll get to play around with an awful lot of these different loadout options. For now, though, these aircraft, as they were shipped to the Soviet Union, had... Uh, the extra, they had the branding 303 machine guns with the extra four mounted in the um, leading edge of the wings. Uh, we'll take the extra ammo because I see no reason why not to. And they also had the Vokes air filter, and the reason for that was because the Soviets were expecting to operate these things on very dusty airfields out on the steppe. And um, therefore, they had dust filters installed. And that the, the effect of that basically is it, it does slow you down a little bit because it creates more drag having that installed on the nose. But um, they did use them. All the uh, Hurricanes shipped to the Soviet Union had air filters on them, so in the interests of being true to the history, we're going to use it. Even though I don't think it serves any actual gameplay function. You can take, you can, you can not use the air filter and you will not be penalised in any fa fashion whatsoever. I'll just hit synchronised payload here so everybody's got the same as us. And uh, that'll be us ready to go, I think. Or All we got to do now is hit accept mission the campaign generator, generator will generate it and uh i'll see you guys in the game all right here we are in the hangar just to inspect our faithful steed before we get underway uh as you can see it's got the uh the operation benedict markings on it still fu 56 uh in this case and uh we're probably going to be keeping these markings until eventually i wreck the airplane <laughs> <laughs> we have to replace it. The rest of the squadron will be flying in Soviet markings. They'll have uh, 
all of the RAF bits sort of like painted over and they'll have the red stars on them and stuff like that. Um, but we'll be flying in our Operation Benedict Hurricane for now. Uh, as you can see, we've got the machine guns in the in the wings. They are big, nasty, thick wings that create a lot of drag. The Hurricane is not a very fast aircraft. It is wonderful, wonderful fighter plane, state of the art in 1935 when it was first flown not so much in 1941 it's a bit slow compared to its competitors on the german side um its main advantage is that it has stunning horizontal performance it can turn on a dime if you see the enemy coming there's a very very good chance you'll be able to dodge clean out of the way of his shots without any issues whatsoever it is one of the things that pilots who flew this plane loved about it as long as they could spot the enemy coming they were supremely confident they would survive trouble is it's the one you don't spot that gets you at the end of the day but hey um the, the hurricane served through right through almost to the end of the war i believe with a variety of countries the british obviously used it but we exported it all over the place the soviets used thousands of these things even the dutch got their hands on on some i think out in the east indies um all over the place i'm pretty sure portugal had some too they were not, <laughs> not that they played a huge role in world war ii but portugal bought some hurricanes as well and they, they were just they were used everywhere even finland had some which makes the hurricane very unusual in that it is one of the very few planes that can help hold the dubious distinction of having been used by both sides of the war <laughs> because the Finns obviously fought on the side of the axis for most of it so um yes the hurricane is a marvelous good old workhorse obviously made famous largely by the battle of britain in which it played an incredibly important role shooting down 55 percent of all enemy aircraft it shot down more planes than the spitfire did and uh, I love the Hurricane. I've spent years flying it in various flight sims. Obviously, I spent a good thousand or so hours flying this thing in um, Isle 2 Cliffs of Dover, which is the predecessor of this game. And uh, the version of it they have here in Great Battles is virtually identical. Uh, this is the Mark II version, so it has slightly better performance, though that's not saying much. Aside from that, in all of the respects, it handles and performs almost identically. And honestly, it just feels so very comfy. Um every time i fly this thing around in the game it feels like coming home um which is good because i'm going to need all the familiarity i can get to survive very long in this thing let me tell you because the germans are so much faster than us their pilots are so much better than mine are this is going to be tough this is going to be challenging i am fairly confident of that but we'll see how we can do um main problem with it is going to be these machine guns this is something british pilots complained about soviet pilots also complained about these uh, 303 vickers machine guns are rubbish they are like pea shooters against modern modern as of world war ii anyway modern uh, uh, enemy aircraft they are completely inadequate for the task eventually we will get some replacements for those machine guns but not just yet for now we're going to have to stick it out and use these crappy little pea shooters to the best of our ability right i think that's everything uh the modifications are as follows we've got the four additional browning 303 mgs with the extra ammo merlin 20 engine uh we've got a mirror on the top there to help us with rear visibility because the hurricane does not have a lot of rear visibility you can't see much out of the back of this thing so it's got a mirror on the top there to help us with that a bit, little bit and it's got the vokes air filter on the nose and that's about all there is to say there 100 percent fuel plant as much browning ammo as we can fit on board because we're going to need it and i think we're ready to go so i'll see you on the runway ladies and gentlemen all right ladies and gentlemen here we are on the ground at zanino ready to rock and roll uh, there's four of us as we can see taking off today the wind looks very calm which is always nice um, and here we are out in the middle of a big ass field that's what Zanino pretty much consists of it's a ruddy great big field with some hangars and that's about it um, wait, I believe we share this airbase with a MiG-3 squadron or is it no it was a lag 3 squadron I and, and it, between you and me folks I think I'd actually rather be flying the hurricane than the lag 3 I'm not a big fan of the lag 3 um in fact pretty much nobody is it was not a very good airplane <laughs> anyway um okay i think we should be ready to go uh one thing i do want to do is i want to look down here at the flap indicator you can just see it there under this lever um with the numbers on it we want to just go down to 20 degrees of flap since that is actually the textbook flap setting you're supposed to take off with in the hurricane according to the operating manual everything else looks fine uh just make sure the propeller pitch is set all the way forward it is 
Uh, radiator we want to move all the way open. Uh, to the open position. That is this lever down here we're moving. Oh god, apologies for the track AR wigging out there a little bit. Um, I use track AR for the head tracking, but it is imperfect. Sometimes the infrared camera just sort of wigs out a little bit and I end up looking in completely the wrong direction. Alright chaps, let's go. Let's do this. Keep it nice and steady on the, I say runway, but really in air quotes. Uh, nose comes forward, a little bit of back stick to make sure we don't nose into the ground. We hit 100 miles per hour and up, up and away. The Hurricane is delightfully easy to take off in. I would like to say it's delightfully easy to land in as well, but if I say that, you can virtually guarantee I will botch the landing later. Alright, gears up. Hold shift F to raise the flaps as well. There we go. Interesting thing to note about the flaps and gears, they're both hydraulic and they both use the same switch to operate them. There's an H shifter down there at the bottom right, um, rather like a gear stick in a car and it means that you can actually raise the flap, raise or lower the flaps and raise or lower the gear, but you can't do both at the same time because you're using the same lever to do it. And that's caught me out a few times when I've been on the final approach. Alright, let's get the, uh, the aircraft trimmed out a bit. I'm going to pull bit back a bit on the power, lower the RPM to about 2800. Leave the radiator completely open for now. Um, you can really spank the engine on this thing, actually. You can, run it, you can run it quite hot for a very long time. It's another one of the nice things I like about the Hurricane. Um, the engine is very forgiving. As long as you don't touch the boost cutout switch, which is the big red one on the left there, bottom left there, um, you can run this engine at combat power for quite some time and you won't have any issues. Other than you'll consume an awful lot more fuel than you might otherwise do. Looks like everybody's getting into position. I'm just doing a circuit around the field here, really, to uh, let everybody catch up a bit before we head out. There they are, all of them on my wing. Formation's looking a bit squirrely, lads. We need to work on that, I think. I'm liking the new propeller effect, by the way, that they've included in the latest patch for the game. The, uh, the propeller blade graphics are much improved. It was one of the recent changes in the latest patch. The way it catches the sunlight is just very nice. There we go. Looks like everybody's catching up and getting into position now. Lovely, jubbly. All right, we want to head south. So let's make a little brief left turn here and begin climbing as well. I'm going to shut the canopy now. We will be flying with the canopy open an awful lot. Um, real hurricane pilots did do this. In fact, it was one interesting cultural difference, if you want to call it that, between the Soviet pilots and the British ones during Operation Benedict. The British pilots were constantly telling the Soviets off for taking off and landing with the canopy closed. You're not supposed to do that for safety's sake, essentially, because it means that if the plane tips over or something like that, it means you can actually get out. Um, and so at low level, low at low level, they would fly with the, uh, the British pilots would fly with the, um, with the canopy open very frequently. Um, and they had to, just, they had to constantly tell off the Soviets for not doing that. Um, I'll be flying with it open quite a lot personally because it allows us a degree of better visibility I can look I can sort of lean back a bit out the side and see a little bit better behind me and also you don't have all these spars in the way um, obscuring your view as well and also the glare on the canopy etc etc I'm sure it'd get very loud and very chilly flying with the canopy open in this thing but real pilots did do it because ultimately getting cold and deafened is at least better than being dead so, right, I think we're just about ready to uh, head on out of here now. We'll just climb out to the south here, and uh, we'll see what we encounter, I think. Just get this nice and trimmed out. I'm going to increase engine power a little bit for the climb. Vitaly Solomonov. 
Uh, Brambling's not our call sign, so I don't think that's our guys talking. Our call sign is Rook, for reference. That are the other friendly squadrons in the area. Looks like it's Storm and Brambling are the other two. Not sure which one's the P40s. Uh, it sounds like Storm is the P40s, judging by the, uh, by the, by the subtitles there. So Brambling will be the, uh, be the I-16s. All right. Well, I'm just going to sort of enjoy the view of the endless Russian plains and forest, and I will return to you folks when uh, things are about to get a little bit spicy. <laughs> See you later. All right, I think we've got something. I don't know what those are, but I doubt they're friendly. Got a couple of somethings flying over here. They kind of look like they might be JU-87 Stukas. That's fine by me. I can tangle with Stukas. I don't want to tangle with uh, 109s. That's the main thing, although... I might be able to disappear into this cloud, which is a little inconvenient. Yeah, that's a Stuka, all right. Oh boy, all right. Eyes on the artificial horizon. Sneaky devils, they saw us coming, they were like, quick, die for the clouds. All right, I love the, the effects you get on the windscreen when you fly through clouds in this game, by the way, it's gorgeous. Uh, where have they gone? Anyone see him? Orders, attack nearest air target. If you guys can see him, go for him. They're still following me, so it feels like the answer is a no. Trixie little... Oh, hold on. I appreciate you guys watching at home will never be able to see the distant specs I'm looking at in the distance. I just, <laughs> YouTube encoding will just murder it all. Um, to be fair, my eyesight's pretty terrible anyway, so I'm going to struggle too, but not as much as you guys, I suspect. Uh, let me close up the radiator here while we head into this dive. Sorry, I've got the HUD off there. I should... There we go. Okay, I need the techno chat to know which sort of position my uh, radiator lever is in, unfortunately. Okay, I briefly spotted them there for a second. I've lost them again. I, d I have the large enemy contacts option enabled, so the enemy aircraft appear a little bit larger from further away to help spot them. Both for the sake of YouTube and also for my own crappy eyesight, but it seems that... Uh it's not helping me much today. Now, what are those up there? Is that them? I don't know where my mates have gotten to. But I see two contacts over there, and I think that might be them. Obviously, spotting and identifying aircraft is a big part of combat in this in this part of the war. For the entire war, really, actually. Um... And sometimes you did just lose them and they disappeared. It was a thing that very much happened. But I think that might be them over there. Don't know where everyone else has gone to. So the annoying thing about this game is you can't really communicate very much with your uh, with your squadron mates. I have the map icons turned on to sort of help me with that a little, to sort of simulate that a little bit, so we can see where our friendly planes are and sometimes where enemy planes are but it seems to be incredibly inconsistent as to whether or not it's actually going to work so at the minute there are no plane indicators except for my own but sometimes you load up a mission and they are there and it 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 seems to make virtually no sense in terms of like whether or not you can spot them They're not behind us are they looking in the mirror right now i don't see them Life-saving tool, the old mirror. Oh, anyway, that's definitely those Stuka friends. They have not eluded me forever. 
Ah, I think that's one of our chaps back there behind us. Yep, that's a silhouette of a hurricane if ever I saw one. You can tell because of those perfectly straight wings with like no dihedral on them whatsoever. And that looks like Soviet flak shooting up at the uh, Stukas, I would imagine. Possibly, anyway. I'm so close to the front lines, it's difficult to say, on it, really, whose side it is. Alright, I'm going to put the nose down a little bit to gain some speed here. Hopefully our friend here on my wing is going to engage in an attack as well, and he's not just going to follow me around and not contribute, because they do do that sometimes. The, the AI definitely has a problem, an aggression problem at the lower levels with the more inexperienced pilots. They, they don't, they're not very keen to actually engage. All right, here we go. There we go. I gave him a good one from all 12 barrels there, and as you can see, it did very little to him. I don't want to hit, stick around behind them for too long because they do have rear gunners. Open up the water radiator. Come on, guys. Get involved. The glare is so much I can barely even see the gun sight. And there's a lot of turbulence knocking us around as well, which doesn't help. Right, I think he's just jettisoned his bomb. Yeah, he's jettisoned his bombs, which is good. He might be going down now, it's difficult to say. He's leaking all sorts of fluids. Also, there's some aircraft down below us there. I'm not sure what they are. Problem with my AI comrades is they like to follow me around in a way that makes it look a little bit like they're coming in on me for an attack run. <laughs> It's always a little bit disconcerting. But, yeah, no, you are definitely a hurricane. We've got to watch out, because there are... There is a squadron of Italians on this section of the front line. And uh, they fly MC-202s, and unfortunately MC-202s, at a glance, look eerily similar to a hurricane. So, when the Italians are around, target identification is become, going to become really, really important. Looks like there might be some more of them down there. Attacking some ground targets. There's definitely flak shooting at them. And we are on the Soviet side of the line, so there are going to be baddies, no doubt. Gotta close up the radiators, we go into this dive. I don't want to overcool the engine. Looks like more Stukas, perhaps. Yeah, that looks like a Stuka to me. Alright, I've got to watch our speed in this dive. The Hurricane is not very good at going fast. It prefers to be slow, generally speaking. In fact, we're just... Yeah, we're going so fast. I, the aircraft is pulling out of the dive all by itself. The vertical performance of this machine is quite dreadful. It's really quite dreadful. The, the general idea, if you want to succeed in the hurricane, is to drag the enemy down to your level and fight them in the mud, where you have the advantage. And don't engage in any vertical shenanigans with them. Alright, Sunny Jim. Alright, his gunner is shooting at us. really keep our heads on a swivel here looking out for enemy fighters because I'm sure they'll turn up sooner or later. Usually when we're low on ammo and fuel, that's what they like to do. Well, I am a little surprised these guys don't have an escort. 
Perhaps the Jerrys are feeling a bit complacent. I don't know. I should be careful here as well, actually, because the Stuka, I have to admit, is one of the very few aircraft that is better at being slow than the Hurricane is. <laughs> so, I need to watch myself here. That, that goofy looking monstrosity out the front window there can actually outturn a hurricane if it puts its mind to it. Put some, right, I'm out of... I think my outer guns are out of ammo, which means I've got very little left in the inners. But it looks like this gun might be going down. I thought I saw some shots going to the cockpit there, but I'm not sure. No, it looks like he's very much still airworthy for now. going in now. If any of my comrades were here to take advantage of this, this would be great, but they're not. I don't know where they've gotten to. Oh, I think we got him. Yeah, he's not coming out of that dive. I think I finally managed to get the pilot. Whew, all of that for one one aircraft. Welcome to the Vickers 303 Browning experience. <laughs> Deary me. Considering how many enemy aircraft the, the, the RAF shot down during the Battle of Britain, it does make you wonder how much more they might have achieved had they been flying aircraft with decent weapons. They were slightly more effective than just throwing rocks at the enemy. And by rocks, I suppose I really mean pebbles, you know, like gravel. All right, something just burst into flames over there. I'm not sure what that is. I missed it. Uh, there was some chatter on the radio about it just now, but I missed it. Hopefully, that's one of our guys just shot down an enemy and not the other way around. Uh, flight leader orders. Orders. Um, yeah, regroup everybody. Whatever that was, it's just gone in. Whatever happened to the rest of them will be a bit of a mystery that will uh, hopefully be solved by the debriefing screen. But for now, I have no idea what everyone's got, where everyone's got to. But we need to go home because we're virtually out of ammo. So, but I'm pretty sure we are completely out of ammo now. So, I see a dot in the sky over there. I see a village that's very much in flames. I'm going to go ahead and open my radiator. I don't, radiator management is not something we really need to worry about an awful lot in this plane. As I said, the um, the engine is very forgiving. Rarely do you manage to overheat it unless you start playing with the boost cutout. Which I will end up doing if we end up getting into a tussle with enemy fighters. We'll need every ounce of power we can get our hands on. But um, it wasn't necessary to touch it at all during that fight against a couple of Stukas. So... Well, I'm going to call this one a success. We damaged one Stuka. We severely damaged a second one and forced him to drop his bombs early. Um, and we shot down a third. So, all in all, quite a successful operation, I think. Uh, the question is, how many of our guys managed to survive? Hopefully all of them, but you never know. They might have found some creative and interesting ways to get themselves shot down. Because I tell you, man, don't underestimate the friendly AI's ability to find a way to get itself killed. It is quite amazing in that regard. Right, we've come back in over our lines plenty now. I think we can just turn north at this point. Start heading back home. I admit, I admit, I am cheating a bit using the um, using the player aircraft icon on the map to navigate. 
If I was being really hardcore about it, I'd turn that off. So I have to do all the navigation the hard way by looking out the window and comparing to the map and what have you. And I'm sure that would have been a really, really, really challenging element of flying in darkest Russia here um, without, well, without any real serious landmarks like coastlines to rely on. But um, honestly, flying and commentating I find to be hard enough. The problem with this dogfighting malarkey is that you have to you have to think fast and that's difficult to do when your thoughts are being slowed down by the fact that you're speaking most of them out loud <laughs> I find it much harder to, uh, to fly while talking but um, if I didn't give it a go you wouldn't have a video would you so that'd be no fun Alright, let's adjust our course about five degrees to the left here. Oh, looks like apparently we destroyed one of the other ones. I'm not going to claim that when we get to the uh, debriefing though, because we didn't see it go down, so it's not really confirmed. Because that's how it worked in real life. You needed witnesses and, and, and corroborating evidence to actually get credited with a claim. The, uh, the techno chat in the bottom left popping up and saying, you got him after he flew 20 minutes afterwards, after you shooting him, does not count in my book. I'm thinking those two dots over there might be our friends. Moving to regroup with this, but I'm not really sure, honestly. In fact, we can cheat. We can, we can, we can go through the friendly aircraft, so... Uh, we have... I think they're okay. I counted three hurricanes there. One, two, three. Yeah, everybody's good. Nobody's dead, amazingly. That's the P-40's landing. And that's the Ishaks, the I-16's marvellous little aeroplane, the Ishak. It's um, even more hopelessly obsolete than the Hurricane, but it is really fun to fly. It's a lot more nimble than the Hurricane, and to its credit. It has a much better roll rate, you know, from side to side and what have you. Some, you can pull off some impressive aerobatics in that thing, even if it is a bit slower. The Hurricane is a much more stable platform, shall we say. A bit like the Typhoon that came after it. One of the side effects of those big thick wings, I suspect. You can sort of point it in a direction and it will largely, with a bit of elevator trim, just keep going in that direction without, me, without you touching the stick at all. We're getting bounced around a little bit by some turbulence right now, but aside from that, as you can see, I don't have my hands on the controls right now, and we're just... We're pretty much going in the direction I pointed it in, and that's just... That's that's what the Hurricane was like. It was it was not like the Spitfire or anything like that, you know. It was described as a very stable platform, and you had to be quite firm on the controls to get it to respond. Anyway, I've talked enough. I'll see you for the landing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're here. Pay no attention to the warning clacks, and it's just letting me know that the throttle was idled without the gear down. Little safety measure. Slightly annoying safety measure, but it's a safety measure. Um, there's Zanino, ready to land. We need to be very careful about this, because Zanino is basically a big grass field with some hangars. Now, this is not unusual for early in World War II. The RAF actually operated a lot of bases like this out of the UK. Big grass field, some hangars. The advantage of that being, you know, you can take off and land in virtually any direction where there's room, um, regardless of the wind, etc, etc. Very nice. Lots of room to take off with a big squadron at once as well. Um, problem is, uh, these Soviets don't really quite grasp the concept, apparently, because they've littered the entire field with lots and lots of things to crash into, like trucks and parked aeroplanes and things like that. So we need to actually land on a very specific bit of grass in order to not crash into anything. There's actually a little white T marked on the ground uh, over there, which marks the end of the runway, which is what we're going to use to guide our landing in. First of all, though, flight leader orders. Return to base, everybody. Everybody is indeed alive. They're back here with me. They did manage to catch up. And uh, I think we're going to be landing kind of slightly diagonal from where I'm pointed right now. I'm going to come in on a sort of curved approach here. Uh, gear down. I'll put the flaps down in a minute as well once we pass 140 miles per hour. 
There it is. Flaps as well. Just dumping that speed like a champion. The Hurricane is, of course, very good at dumping speed. All right, touch more throttle now. We want to approach at about 100 miles per hour and then land slightly slower than that. There as well. I don't know if you can see it on YouTube, but the white T marker is just out in front of us there. Windsock on our left. But, yeah, we're moving at like biplane speeds right now. It's marvellous. The Hurricane, once it's got its flaps out, it can fly so slowly. <laughs> Oh, beautiful landing. If I do say so myself. There's our chums over there. Circuiting the field. Now, theoretically, as a squadron leader, I really ought to be the one to land last. That is sort of kind of the unwritten etiquette of this sort of thing, but... Uh, if I did that, I'd be here waiting for absolutely ages because it takes forever for the uh, for the AI to land. In real life, they do formation landings and get everybody down at once. Um, but in the game, they sort of circle around and do it one at a time, and it takes an absolute age. Waste a lot of fuel as well. So for brevity's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and land first most of the time. Unless there's somebody already on approach, in which case I'll let them go first. Mostly for safety, honestly. I mean, it'd be a bit of a silly way to end the campaign after all. Okay, flaps up. That's what it looks like with the flaps down, by the way. They are big, stonking, huge hydraulic flaps, these things. You can see why they uh, help slow you down a lot. Let's raise them back up. And kill the engine. Lovely jubbly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it uh, has been a pleasure. But that's it for the mission today. Uh, hopefully the other guys will land nice and safely. I'm not going to stick around and find out, though. But welcome back to Zanino, safe and sound. No, not a single hole of damage on us anywhere. I am stunned. Not even the Stuka gun has managed to get a hit on us, which is really quite nice. And more importantly, all our chums are alive and well. There they are, in fact, right now, just flying overhead. One of them looks like he might be coming into land, in fact. Um, and yeah, that, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to see that, because our primary kind of... Um, our kind of primary goal here as Squadron Commander is not really so much to get kills ourselves, it's to make sure our, our buddies survive as long as possible. Um, and don't get killed. Because if they do all keep getting killed and, you know, start dropping like flies, it's only going to make the game harder because they'll get replaced with fresh recruits whose AI is even worse. So, um, yeah, our primary goal is to make sure our, our, our chums survive. If possible, I'd like them to get some kills as well. But primarily, we just want them to survive as many missions as possible. Although, of course, if we die, it'll be the end of the campaign. So um, there's a limit to... <laughs> There's a limit to how far I'm going to go out on a limb for this lot. Because they can make some pretty stupid decisions from time to time. Let's check out this landing, shall we? Coming in at a glacial pace. Just one small itty bitty bounce. Not bad, sir. Well done, well done. We have taught you well. It's hard to land any of the planes in this game without a little bounce like that, to be fair, because the ground effect is incredibly exaggerated versus real life. Aeroplanes don't don't tend to bounce like that unless you've really, really come in way too hot. Once they're on the ground, they'll settle on the landing gear quite nicely, generally speaking. Um, but in this game, there's always a bit of a bounce for some reason. Never really been able to figure out why. Anyway... I'll see you in the campaign generator.
All right, folks, it's debriefing time. Let's do this. Uh, oh, I didn't realize the Ebb and Luitsa were with us on this mission. No wonder they were a little more competent than usual. We had two of our best pilots on that mission with us. <laughs> didn't even notice. I probably should pay attention to the assignments a little bit more in the future, really. Um, let's see. Continue with claims. Uh, we're going to claim one Stuka shot down. The game thinks I shot down two, but we, we definitely saw one go in. The other two we just damaged, as far as I know. I think at a push, you could probably claim one of the Stukas as a probable. Um probably destroyed as opposed to definitely confirmed destroyed but uh, the game the debriefing system doesn't do probables so we destroyed one ju87 submit report and here's the fun bit for the folks at home uh we'll do maximum information start debrief and it will give us the whole log of everything that happened there you go so um, I'll go up to the top here, and for the benefit of those of you at home who like to comb through this and sort of do the intelligence office thing of, of trying to piece together exactly what happened during the mission, you may do so. So here we go. Let's drop through all this. Looks like a lot of ground combat happened, machine guns destroying other machine guns. Uh, and a tank destroyed them as well. Oh, there were some German tanks down there somewhere. I imagine that's probably what the P-40s were supposed to be attacking. Uh, there we go. And this is where we got into our combat. Stuka destroyed some trucks, it looks like. There we go. And that's the lot. Uh, oh, it looks like Luisa managed to shoot down a JU-87 at some point. When we lost sort of contact with the rest of our squadron, it was because Luisa flew off to go and shoot down another Stuka of other looks of things. Cool. All right, so debrief complete. Let's have a look. Combat's in the air. Remarks on flight and hostile aircraft. Uh, let's see. Uh, Luitsa Miatlev shot down a Ju-87 uh, of STG-77. Major Hildebrand Mummert was seriously wounded, apparently. And uh, and then, yes, we, we got one as well. Oh, Lieutenant. Adolf Rosen was lightly wounded, apparently. Lightly wounded. I guess he bailed out, and I just didn't notice. Because <laughs> he looked pretty dead to me. <laughs> there, went, there was a fireball and everything. But anyway. Nice. I didn't I didn't see that happen, but apparently it did. So, well done, lass. Got another kill for the squadron. Uh, that makes three is our total for now, I think. All right, notification of victory. There we go. And Matve Rusak has been transferred to the 157th. So we've got a new, new couple of new pilots, it looks like. Matve and Alexei. And that wraps it up. All right, the squadron roster is, in, is, is increased, which is nice. I don't, I don't know if we necessarily have enough aircraft for all of them. <laughs> that's, the, that's the main problem, because uh, I think we might have more pilots than we do Hurricanes at this point. Possibly. It's difficult to say. That can, can happen sometimes. Um, so you'll have more pilots than you can actually take planes out on a mission. So, Right, ladies and gentlemen, that will wrap it up for today. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of the new campaign. I hope you'll tune in for the next. If you did enjoy it, please give the video a like um, because it really does help a lot on particularly first episodes of new series. It really does help if you hit the like button. After that, on subsequent videos, not quite so much, but on the first video, yeah, it's a big help because you know algorithm and stuff you know you know the drill anyway so thanks very much everybody tune in next time we'll be continuing our campaign uh and shooting down some more jerrys uh they were very kind to us the germans today they didn't they didn't have any fighters in the air that i'm aware of um not a single 109 to be found which means we had a bit of a turkey shoot there i can guarantee you it will not be that easy going forward uh we just we're just the game seems to be easing us in here a little bit we've gotten quite lucky on this this first sortie so yes gotta watch out for those elite german fighter squadrons because they'll be prowling around and when they find us oh god oh god everyone's going to die anyway <laughs> thanks very much everybody i'll catch you next time toodaloo